Christ. Yeah, hopefully you've got that open. Um, we're going to have our today's passage read in just a moment. Before we do that, I wanted just to briefly introduce the series that we're going to be looking at over the next coming number of weeks. Have any of you ever done the, the, the trust fall? You know, the topple back? I don't think I've done it since probably youth group times. Um, but uh, yeah, tr- trust me, fools. Yeah, uh, I, I came across this one um, a little while ago. Lovely couple uh, doing the trust fall. And it's about here when you start to realize things might be going wrong. <laughs> and, uh, oh dear. <laughs> and this one is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes they go wrong, don't they? I think to some degree, to some degree, take separation of that, to some degree, entrusting ourselves to Jesus can at times feel a bit like a trust fall. Is it safe? Can I do it? Am I going to be caught by the one who says they love me so dearly? There are are a whole load of things that can challenge and uh, make those those thoughts creep in. I think the two major ones often, and the two major ones we'll see in this chapter, firstly, sin, sin from the inside. I can't believe I've done that. I'm a Christian and I've done that. Or I can't believe I've done that again. Does God really still love me? Will he really still truly, fully save me? The other one is would be suffering from the outside when things are going wrong, when we're experiencing pain and difficulties. If God loved me, would he allow these things to happen to me? If I was really one of his? There are all these things that can threaten our confidence in Jesus and his grace. And and just like that person doing the trust fall, it is so tempting to want to take a step back or forward. but uh, Take a step back to try and catch yourselves. So tempting to try and add a portion of self-reliance to our Christian lives. And Romans 8 says, no, keep your feet together and fall back. Your trust is is in a good place. If you've got Romans 8 open in front of me, let me just show you very briefly, just in two verses, to see how the chapter begins. Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then if you flick down to verse, the beginning of verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of of Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So the chapter starts with no condemnation and the chapter ends with no separation from Christ's love. And in between we find a whole host of reasons why we can have confidence in Jesus and this, his salvation. Romans 8 is, is a favorite chapter of many. Are we allowed to say favorite chapters? I think we are. Okay, all parts of the Bible equally God-breathed, equally inspired, equally, well, all useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. But no, Romans 8 really passes the, the hospital bed test, right? If you're, if you're by someone in the hospital bed, you're probably not going to turn to Leviticus. Uh, we were in Leviticus, aren't we? But you're probably not going to turn to Leviticus 7 or 1 Chronicles 3, like a huge genealogy, right? Romans 8 passes that test. Along with Psalm 23, it's the the go-to, isn't it? There is such richness and depths in here. There are many go-to verses. And if this is your favorite chapter in the Bible, well, I hope you're excited. There are truly new depths to, to go down into. And if you're not familiar with Romans 8, you are in for a real treat. Now, by looking at Romans 8, we are, of course, skipping over Romans, Romans chapter 1 to 7. Now, rather than me give you a, a brief recap, which would either be so brief it wouldn't really t- tell you anything, or so in-depth that we'll spend the rest of our time there, uh, rather than go through that, I, I'm going to just refer back to important points as we go through the, the, today's sermon and the series. The one thing I'm going to say is that Romans chapters 1 to 7 lay out what is probably the most comprehensive 
and glorious explanation of salvation by grace through faith that there is in the Bible. I would love it to you. If you're, if you're not sure what to do in your Bible readings at the moment, why not, as we do this series, start at Romans 1 and work your way through to see the grounding for this wonderful chapter? But anyway, let's hear the beginning of Romans chapter 8. Read. Kathy is going to come and read that for us, and then we'll dive into this particular passage. So today passage is Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Great, thanks, Kathy. And let's pray before we dive into these first first wonderful verses. Father God, we thank you for the... the richness and the depths of uh, your word. Thank you for the richness and depths and wonder of this fantastic chapter. And yet they are deep and they are rich and we need your help. Please, Father, would your spirit be our teacher? Would he show us and help us to understand these great words, but also again show us the impact that it has on our lives? Please, would he be mightily and powerfully at work in us? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. But if you've been a Christian for more than a day, you know the feeling of guilt which comes from our failures to walk with Jesus. You know, I think everyone, non-Christians and Christians alike, know the feeling of guilt. But I think Christians can be particularly sensitive to it. It's, it's that weight which bears down on you and the, the, the knowledge of the hypocrisy in your life things you claim to believe and say and do it, but then actually your life as it is. It's that nagging of the conscience of that stupid thing you said an hour ago. It's the shame of that sin that you've done again. It's that feeling of uncertainty before God over the terrible sin that you committed so long ago. Guilt. Guilt comes perhaps because of what we might think of as big sins. Equally, it can come because of the small ones. But whether it's big or small, it's that sustained sense of guilt and shame over sins that have been confessed and repented of. That's key. Over sins that have been confessed and repented of. So that sin that you've done and you've gone to, to Lord, before the Lord and you said, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. I've rebelled against you once again. Please forgive me. Strengthen me to live your way again. And yet that sense of shame and guilt carries on. Maybe even as I've described these feelings this morning, the chest has tightened slightly or the stomach drops. Christians too often carry around a burden that they don't have to. Sometimes sometimes it's because we've kind of muddled in our thinking to think that somehow wallowing in in shame and pity is pleasing to God. Or thinking that uh, some low-level feeling of guilt is going to spur my spiritual life on. Rubbish. Rubbish. Do we really think that God is honoured and pleased when we fail to truly believe his gospel promises? Do you think that? Have a look again at Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Rather, how honoured God is when we truly believe that, when we grab hold of that, when we live by that gospel promise. 
And what a difference it would make to us if we did. See, the first thing, the main thing that we're going to pick up from these verses is there is no condemnation. Condemnation is a, it's a legal word. It's that verdict of guilty. That verdict of guilty, which then leads to punishment. It's the, the, almost the opposite idea of justification. So justification is such a key uh, idea in Paul, uh, in Paul and Romans. He, he spent so much of chapters 3 and 4 explaining how it is that we can be declared innocent. We can be justified. And it's... Um, oh, I thought I had a verse there. No worries, I don't have a verse there. But he, let me read it to you. It's chapter 3. And... Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's the guilty bit. There we all naturally, we've all sinned against God, We're all guilty. Verse 24, and are justified, declared innocent by his grace as a gift through the redemption that it is in Christ Jesus. All guilty, declared innocent by grace through Jesus and through, as chapter 4 explains, through faith. And Paul says that that verdict of guilty that leads to punishment is gone, is done for the Christians. No, no condemnation, he says. You, you go from that courtroom innocent, no guilt. No punishment coming your way. Now, how can that be? How can that be? Well, you see, we're back in chapter 8 now. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1 begins with that, that the therefore. There is therefore now no condemnation. Now, it could be Paul's referring back to the end of chapter 7. I think it's his acting as a bit of a summary, uh, a result of all of what we've seen in chapters 1 to 7. Paul spent the first two and a half chapters declaring how guilty we all are. Everyone. He's like this, the prosecution lawyer in court. And first in is like the out and out rebel. That one who goes, I, I, I don't I have, want anything to do with God. I'm going to live my own way. And he shows how they're guilty. Then he shows the, the kind of moral or good person. And she shows how they are guilty too. And then it's the religiously privileged there's no, they are guilty too. Each one, his case is convincing, the verdict is guilty. But as we've already seen in snapshots, in Jesus, God has provided a way for us to be righteously forgiven. And did you see how, how that was clarified in verse 8? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who are in Christ Jesus. This is chapter 6. I'm going to say more later. But when somebody is converted, we are united with Jesus. We are then in him. How is it there can be no condemnation? Well, it's because of all the glorious gospel that we've seen before. We're going to build, though. But here's the thing for Christians. We understand that. We believe that. We believe there is no condemnation. But again, how can this be true in the light of chapter 7? Because in chapter 7, Paul shares his struggles with sin. Let me just read one verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 19, and see how he describes his experience. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. And then see how he sums it up, verse 24? Wretched man that I am. Again, isn't Paul's experience yours? No, it's certainly mine. The good that I want to do, I fail to do. The things I want to avoid, I end up doing again and again. And Paul's just said, wretched man that I am. And yet in his next breath, wretched man that I am, next breath, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Someone who is in Christ, even though they struggle and fail in their fight with sin, even though they mess up big time or repeatedly, there is no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment. 
how wonderful that is, how unusual that is in our, our world. I think part of the reason why we sometimes struggle to really believe this and grab hold of it is because that is, this is not how life works in our world. Our world is a world of blaming and shaming. You know, your boss or your colleagues always looking for fault to highlight, to make you look bad and make themselves look good. Even loved ones at times, you know, we can't help but remind others of their failures. But not here with God. Paul declares there is therefore now no condemnation, no verdict of guilty, no punishment, even for Christians who are far too aware of their hypocrisy. Even for Christians who again and again say the stupid thing. Even for the Christian who again stumbles over the same thing. Even for the Christian who did that terrible thing long ago. Paul says there is no condemnation. That sounds great, doesn't it? Sounds great. How can, it, how can we be sure? How can we know it's true? How can we truly build our lives upon it? Well, as I, I said in snapshot, the therefore. But now Paul again here gives us reasons why we can be sure there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Do you see how verse 2 begins? For. So when we see the word therefore, you look back. Okay, you look back to what's come, uh, back, been back to what's come before. When you see the word for, you look forwards. It's the word because. There is no condemnation for because. And Paul gives us three connected reasons why we can be truly sure that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And first off, it's because the Spirit has set us free. Have a look at verse 2. For, the, for, because the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Well, first off here, we need to understand what Paul means by law. And this, I, I don't know how many hours I spent just thinking about this question. What does Paul mean by law in these verses? It's a big question. The, the way that Paul uses the word law through Romans, the, the majority of the times he is talking about the Old Testament law. That's the majority of the way that he speaks of it. And yet at times before this, and I'm going to suggest is the case here, Paul uses the word law to kind of mean the, like principle or, or power or authority. And that's what I'm going to suggest it, it means here. And once I've gone through, you can, we can talk at the end whether you agree with me or not. Let me read it again. So with that idea, so when we read law, we're talking about kind of power, authority. Let me read it again. For the law, the power of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law, power of sin and death. Christians, like all people, if my remote stopped working, sorry, can I have the next slide? Um, well, the, the next picture anyway. Thank you. Christians, like all people, were prisoners. And were prisoners of, as it were, sin and death. And the problem was for, well, not the problem, well, yeah, for, for, for Christians, for all people who were in this, like, in this prison under the control of sin and of death, well, in there, in that box, if I can have the next slide, please, there is only and always condemnation. Because sin is that rebellion against God, deserving of condemnation. And death, that ultimate penalty of sin, condemnation. But again, this is chapter 6. Uh, what, um, what verse 2 here says is that the power of the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, we have been set free. And those who have the next slide, did you notice again that it says, in Christ Jesus? You've been set free in Christ Jesus. So if I have the next one, and then the next one. 
Do you see how when uh, a Christian is converted, they, they come in Christ Jesus and we are brought out by the power of the Spirit, freed from sin and death, freed from condemnation. Here's the first reason. Why is it we can be sure there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus? Well, that reign of sin and death, that power of sin and death that only and always leads to condemnation, we've been set free from it by the Spirit in Christ Jesus. Secondly, there's no condemnation because Jesus came and died. Have a look at verse 3. For, again, here's the reason building upon it. For God has done with what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus came and died. You see, the law, he start, Paul starts off by saying what the law couldn't do. The law could never save someone. The law could never, ever save someone. The only verdict the law, the Old Testament law, could ever give was guilty. That was it. Only thing. And it could never save. But did you notice, it, 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 the problem isn't just with the law itself. It's because of the, the weakness of the flesh. Weakened by our, our flesh, our, our, um, our, our sinful natures. The law could never save so God has done what the law couldn't do. How did he do it? Well, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So here's the key thing. Jesus came. Jesus came into our world. He took on flesh with all its weaknesses. He really was tempted and yet was without sin. John Stott really helps, really helpfully um, explains what, what's meant here. He says that Paul, he's, John Stott says that Paul says it's not in the likeness of flesh, which would only be seemingly to be human. No, his humanity was real. Nor does Paul say in sinful flesh, meaning he had that fallen nature. No, Jesus was sinless. But it's in the likeness of sinful flesh. Did you follow that? Yeah, I saw a few glazed looks as I was going there. Not quite. Okay, so let me try, try and say that one again. Notice Paul says, in the likeness of sinful flesh. He doesn't say in the likeness of flesh by itself. Not in the likeness of flesh. Because that would mean that he wasn't really human. Equally, he doesn't say in sinful flesh. Because then he would be participating in the sinful nature. No, it's in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was, truly was human. His humanity was real, and yet he was sinless at the same time. And that meant, well, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. You can see the, the little footnote down there says, uh, or, and as a sin offering. So that word sin is what is the word used in the... Greek translation of the Old Testament as a sin offering. So Jesus came as that sin offering, the sacrifice that would die in the place of the people. And that's explained further. He, God, condemned sin in the flesh. Sin, actually, here we go. I've uh, got my slides again. So he, here we got. No, we don't. Might come up in a minute. Uh, we've got. Uh, lost my train of thought. There we go. Thank you. Um, so we've got sin and death. Remember, that's the, the box that we said that we were all in. Well, actually, Jesus took that condemnation. All that condemnation that, that we deserved because of sin, Jesus took it himself. It was condemned in him. Why is there no condemnation for Christians in Christ? Because sin was condemned in Christ. He took that full penalty as he died on the cross. And finally, third reason. Because the righteous requirements of the law is fulfilled in 
us. Have a look at verse 4. Notice again the linking word, in order that. So Jesus came in the flesh to, to die in the place of sinners as a sin offering, to have sin condemned in him, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The righteous requirement of the law, that, that word is used three other times uh, in the book of uh, Romans. The first instance, it says, the righteous requirement of the law, the right thing is that sinners deserve to die. That's what it means. That's what it says. And the other two make the points that uh, show, the, show the right way to live. And in both of those instances, Jesus fulfilled those things perfectly. The law says the righteous requirement of the law is that sinners die. But Jesus died. The righteous requirement of the law shows the right way to live. Well, Jesus lived that way perfectly, even to the point of death. And so as we uh, think back to, to this uh, diagram and remember how when we are in Christ, he brings us out of sin and death. Well, we also remember that Jesus was utterly righteous. He met the right requirement of the law. And then when we are in him, the law is fulfilled in us. His righteousness is given to us. So in that sense, the law is fulfilled in us. Mark gave a um, a helpful illustration in a sermon a while back. If, if you were here, if you, I'll try and recap it, if not. On camp, we play this game called Crocker, which is a cricket bat and a rugby ball, and you kind of, or a football or any, anything, really. But it's like rounders, so you whack the ball. And, and in the illustration Mark gave is that sometimes there are little children on camp, and they go up with a little bat they can't really hold. Uh, and they can't do it, but kind of dad comes in and holds it around them and then kind of whack wax it away, and the child's like, wow, look what I've done. Um, uh, and the point that Mark was making in this illustration was that it is how God comes in and uses our weak and feeble efforts in, in our ministry and in our evangelism, and he takes those little things that we can do and adds the power to it. If I can twist his illustration, there are times, you know, when the game is on the line, when you say, little child, stand over there. This one's mine. Whack! And you hit it as far as you can. And then you take the child's hands and you walk them around, you take them around, and it's their run. Okay, but really, Dad did it, right? And so, in the, the righteous requirement of the law, this isn't something we're involved in. This is Jesus. Whack! But it's credited to us, to our accounts, as he takes us by the hand and brings it round. Can we see how these three things, three connected things, give us confidence that truly there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because we have been set free from sin and death, the power of sin and death. <coughs> sin and death that only led to condemnation, we've been liberated from it. Secondly, there's no condemnation for us because Jesus bore that condemnation himself. And then thirdly, there's no condemnation because the requirement of the law has been met in us because of what Jesus did. There is no condemnation. If you're, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you're not trusting in Jesus, can I ask you, what, what is it that you do with your guilt? My, my guess is that you feel it. I think everyone feels it to some degree. We, we try and suppress it. We try and ignore it. We try and kind of sort it out ourselves. But if we admit it, sorry, if we, if we actually do admit it, then our default tendency is to try and sort it out ourselves. What can I say to you? Look, hopefully by what you've seen, even this morning, we're going to see again and again, we cannot do it ourselves. We cannot sort ourselves out. We cannot deal with that guilt and the shame. We can't put the foot back to try and catch ourselves. The only way, the only safe place is in Jesus. But in him, there is no condemnation. Come to him. Come to him in faith. 
But Christians, those of us who are trusting, let me offer three implications as we draw to a close. Firstly, get a better grasp on the gospel. Get a better grasp on the gospel. Okay, those subjective sense, that, that subjective sense of guilt that we so often experience comes from not being clear on the objective declaration of innocence. When we're not clear, crystal, crystal clear, grasping, holding on to the fact that in the Lord Jesus, there's no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment to come. Rather, there's innocence declared to you. When we're not clear on that, well, that is what results in that, that guilt and shame. So get a better grasp on the gospel. When we have those feelings of shame, take them to the gospel. Don't seek assurances anywhere other than in the work of Jesus. Not in your good work, not in your performance. One author put this really helpfully. He said, it's impossible to resolve issues of yesterday by doing better tomorrow. Instead, we look back further than yesterday. We look back to Jesus coming in the flesh to have sin condemned in his flesh. You want to, build, build, you want to beat guilt, beat shame, confess. Come to the Lord Jesus. You've got, you've got to do that. You've got to confess. You've got to ask for help to change. But then believe in these gospel promises. So first off, get a better grasp of the gospel. Secondly, don't dwell in the guilt. To, to insist on feeling guilty is another way of insisting on helping God with our salvation. You follow that? Let me say that again and I'll explain it. To insist on feeling guilty is another way of insisting on helping God with our salvation. Because if, we're only, if we only don't feel guilty when we're doing well, well, you are depending on your performance not on what Jesus has done. Christians should feel grieved. We should feel sorry. We should feel repentant when we're confronted with our sins. We don't shy away from it. We shouldn't feel guilty. We shouldn't feel shame. Because Jesus has dealt with that. There's no condemnation. And one final one, I, I do want to just uh, briefly think about the, the kind of sufferings that, that come, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, come upon us. Those times when you think, Lord, what's going on here? Well, when those difficult things come upon us, when you ask that question, why, Lord? We usually don't know. But there is one thing that you can definitely rule out, that this is God's punishment on you. You can rule that out. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Discipline, maybe. Maybe, we don't know. Discipline, maybe, but not condemnation. Not punishment. Because in Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation. What wonderful, liberating truth that is. <coughs> that is. Let's pray. Just as we, before we sing. Father, we read these words, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so often we fail to, to really grab hold and grasp them and to, to believe this. Yet, Father, please, with our grasp on the gospel, from what we've seen today and as we see through, see through this series, please give us confidence and assurance and certainty in the completed work of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.